Hello and welcome to WaveScan, the international DX program from Adventist World Radio. Researched and written in Indianapolis by Dr. Adrian Peterson and produced in the studios of WRMI Shortwave in Miami. I'm Jeff White. On today's WaveScan, the Titanic anniversary, wireless signals from the Titanic, Matchbox Radio, and our Philippine DX report. It was on Sunday night, April 14, 1912, just before midnight, that the new and mighty passenger liner Titanic struck a supersized iceberg in the Atlantic 400 miles south of Newfoundland. Just two and three-quarter hours later, she was at the bottom of the Atlantic, broken into two separate pieces at a depth of more than two miles down. That tragic event with the loss of 1,500 people happened exactly 102 years ago. Ray Robinson of KVOH has our story. Thanks, Jeff. The iceberg that was the culprit in this hideous shipping tragedy stood out of the water nearly 200 feet high, with an estimated weight anywhere up to half a million tons. This iceberg was composed of snow that fell in Greenland a few thousand years earlier, and it broke off the end of a glacier two or three years before the impact with the Titanic. Titanic historians tell us that half a dozen black and white photographs of the culprit iceberg are still in existence today, one of which was taken two days before collision day by Captain W.F. Wood in command of the ship Estonian. Two other photographs taken after the collision show in black and white what was described at the time as a long red streak near the waterline apparently caused when the hull of the Titanic scraped along the edge of the berg. As we know, wireless played a critical role in the rescue of the 700 survivors who lived through this historic tragedy. Just before her original shakedown cruise, the Titanic was loaded with a complete set of the latest versions of wireless and radio equipment. There were two Spark wireless communication transmitters and two receivers. The main transmitter was rated at 5 kilowatts output into a four-wire T-type center-fed antenna that was suspended between two masts at a level of 250 feet above the sea. The natural resonant wavelengths of the antenna were 162.5 and 325 meters, though the tuning circuits gave radiant frequencies of 300 or 500 kilohertz in what we would call today the standard long wave band. Electrical power for this main transmitter was taken from the ship's electrical circuits. The signal from the main transmitter was guaranteed for 250 miles, though during the shakedown cruise it was discovered that the signal could be heard at 400 miles during the day and 2,000 miles at night. There was also an emergency transmitter with power taken from a set of batteries. There was one regular detector crystal wireless receiver and also one of the very latest valve or tube type radio receivers. Due to the boomingly noisy signal from the hefty spark transmitter, this equipment was installed into a heavily padded room next to the operating room. This transmitter room was named, rather appropriately in the understated terminology of the era, as the silent room. The original call sign allocated to the Titanic in January 1912 was MUC, though shortly afterwards this was changed to the now more familiar MGY. In those days, the initial letter M identified the ship's wireless operators as representing the Marconi Company in England, although subsequently the letter M came to be one of the initial call letters assigned to identify any radio station operating from Great Britain. During the initial leg of the voyage across the Atlantic, the two wireless operators, John Phillips and Harold Bride, worked consistently to process incoming and outgoing signals in the continental version of Morse code. This wireless traffic was made up of normal routine messages for the navigation of the world's proudest passenger liner across a wide oceanic expanse, as well as expensive, though generally unnecessary, messages from wealthy passengers to relatives, friends and business associates. Among the incoming messages were at least a couple from other ships warning of icebergs in the main shipping lanes. At 11.40pm local time on Sunday, April 14, 1912, the Titanic hit the supersized, irregularly shaped iceberg that rendered her doom. 
Some passengers describe the sound as like the continuous tearing of a sheet of calico, a kind of cotton cloth, though the entire impact caused no more than a slight shudder as the vessel reacted to the collision. However, the damage to the underwater section of the hull was so great that tons of water rapidly surged into the stricken vessel. An immediate inspection of the damage in the lower decks revealed very quickly that the unsinkable Titanic was indeed sinking. The elderly and highly experienced Captain Edward J. Smith gave orders to the two wireless operators to send out a distress signal indicating that the ship was doomed. At 12.15 a.m. on Monday morning, Phillips tapped out the message CQD de MGY six times, giving also the geographic coordinates for the Titanic at the time. He continued with the additional information that the Titanic was indeed sinking, and he asked for the assistance of any ships that were nearby. The senior wireless operator was 25-year-old John Phillips, better known as Jack Phillips. He had already served as the Marconi wireless operator on several other ships, including the well-known Victorian, the Lusitania, and the Mauritania. He joined the Titanic in Belfast one month before the encounter in the Atlantic. Phillips kept tapping out the old and new distress signals, CQD and SOS, until water began to flood into the wireless room. He was swept overboard and died in the freezing cold water a few minutes later near to the upturned lifeboat B. Phillips had never married. The second wireless operator was 21-year-old Harold Bride. He also had worked on several other ships, including the Lusitania, before joining the Titanic. It was he who suggested to Phillips to use both the old and the new distress signals, CQD and SOS. Young Bride was washed overboard when the Titanic was sinking, but he survived by climbing onto the upturned lifeboat B. He was rescued after daylight and transferred to the heroic rescue ship Carpathia, whose callsign was MPA, where he assisted the wireless operator there in sending out a multitude of messages in Morse code, even though he was still recovering from injuries. Eight years after the Titanic episode, Harold Bride married Lucy Downey, and they had three children, Lucy, John and Jeanette. Bride died in Scotland in 1956 at the age of 66. The wireless operator on board the rescue ship Carpathia was 21-year-old Harold Cotton. His ship was the first on the scene after the midnight collision, and they rescued 700 survivors. Cotton sent his messages to Cape Race in Newfoundland via the ship Olympic, whose call sign was MKC. Ten years later, Harold Cotton married Elsie Shepperson, and they had four children, Bill, Jean, Sybil and Angus. Cotton died in England in 1984 at the age of 93. Because the Titanic accident occurred in the Western Atlantic, all of the wireless traffic was with either ships at sea or with land stations in North America via relays through nearby ships. However, it's known that two people in Europe did actually hear some of the live wireless traffic in Morse code from the Titanic. Over in Wales, at the time of the original distress signals from the Titanic, amateur wireless operator Arthur Moore in Gellygrove's Mill near Blackwood heard the CQD de MGY and subsequent messages. He reported the sinking of the Titanic to the local police, but they scoffed at his information. However, Marconi subsequently learned of Moore's reception of the Titanic signals, and Moore was invited into employment with the Marconi company, which he served for more than 30 years. And then over in Vienna, Austria, the philosopher and scientist Karl Unger also heard the CQD and SOS messages from the Titanic. The American radio magazine Broadcasting showed a photograph of the primitive Unger wireless equipment in their issue dated June 1, 1937. You're listening to WaveScan from Adventist World Radio. Send your comments and reception reports to Wavescan, Box 29235, Indianapolis, Indiana, 46229 in the United States. That's Wavescan, Box 29235, Indianapolis, Indiana, 46229 in the USA. 
or you can email us at wavescan at awr.org. Our email once again, wavescan at awr.org. Thank you, Ellen Graham of HCJB. Matchboxes are our next topic on WaveScan today. The first matches were invented by John Walker in England in 1826, and they were sold under the name Walker Match. Back then, the word match identified a lamp wick. Sometimes, though, these early matches unexpectedly caught fire, and they were considered at times to be quite dangerous. To solve this problem, Johan Edvard Lundström in Sweden invented what he called the Swedish safety match in 1855. Then, ten years later, Bryant and May in England began the manufacture of a safety match. These were all small pieces of wood that had been dipped into a special chemical at one end, and they were sold in small boxes containing 60 or 100. It is stated that 800,000 tons of matches were manufactured throughout the world in 1973, and that 5 trillion matches are used every year. The invention of paper matches in a folding cover is dated in the 1880s in the United States. These are less bulky and more easily carried. However, their introduction worldwide was not rapid, and Japan, for example, did not manufacture them until the year 1956. It appears that the first advertising on match covers took place in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, under attorney Joshua Pusey in 1889 though the only known example of this match cover has not been seen for almost a lifetime. However, since that time, advertising on match covers can only be described as prolifically voluminous. The first collector's club was formed by three people in Japan in 1903, and it is claimed that there were one million collectors worldwide during the 1940s and 1950s. The hobby of collecting items related to matches is known as philumeni, taken from the Greek phil, or loving, and Latin lumen, or light. This name was coined by Marjorie Evans in England in 1943. Those who collect these match-related items sometimes choose to collect the actual match boxes with matches enclosed, or paper match covers, or simply the match box label, or the advertising label. The largest collection in the world belongs to Ed Broussard in Del Mar, California, and his collection currently numbers 3.2 million items. Various forms of radio advertising is evident on matchbox labels and match covers. For example, generic advertising for radio is known on matchbox labels printed in Australia, Latvia, Japan, and the United States, and certainly other countries as well. The Australian matchbox label shows a small radio station and two antenna towers. A radio shop, known as The Radio Shop in Berkeley, California, advertised on another matchbox label, and the Hotel Dixie in New York City stated that they had installed a radio receiver in every room. That must have been before TV. Well, there must have been a multitude of local radio stations advertising on these filuminary labels, such as, for example, KSO in Des Moines, Iowa, radio's finest. KVOD in Denver, Colorado, Blue Network affiliate. WAKR in Akron, Ohio, for tops in news. And WBAL in Baltimore, Maryland, with the call sign WBAL printed on each paper matchstick. Examples of double advertising for a radio station and another commercial organization are as follows. KANS in Wichita, Kansas, together with the Hotel Lassen, WILM in Wilmington, Delaware, with Carling's Drinks, and WCSC in Charleston, South Carolina, with Esso Gasoline. There are no known advertisements for shortwave stations on Matchbox labels. However, the enterprising Major Lawrence Mott operated two radio broadcasting stations on Catalina Island off the coast of Los Angeles, California, back in the late 1920s, and his shortwave, W6XAD, often relayed the programming from his medium wave, KFWO. A matchbox label from that era 
portrays the medium wave station KFWO on Catalina Island on 300 meters or 1,000 kilohertz. And a woman diving into the ocean seems to be saying, in all the world, no trip like this. You're listening to WaveScan from Adventist World Radio. Let's go now to Henry Oman High in the Philippines with his monthly DX report. Hello everyone to our dear shortwave listeners. Good evening, good morning, wherever you're welcome to the April 13th edition of the Philippine DX News. This is report number 86. I'm Henry Umadai in Bacolod City, Negros Occidental Central Philippines. Glad to be back and thank you for listening. I would like to thank our DXer friends for sending the reception reports. Mr. Jose Jacob in Hyderabad, India and Mr. Rodolf Sontag in Gelching, Germany. Thank you very much. A14 broadcast schedule in English. Vival Voice, Eternal Good News, 1700, 15, 2 and 5 colors every Saturday from work to call in Germany. 18, 15 UTC, 11, 8, 5, 5 colors every Sunday from Norway in Germany. 11, 30, 15, 5, 2, 5 colors every Friday from Abu Dhabi, United Arab Emirates. Radio Habana, Cuba, 2100 to 2300, 11, 670 kilohertz to Europe. World Harvest Radio, T8WH, 0100 to 0300, 15680 kilohertz every Sunday from Palau. Vatican Radio, 0140 to 0159, 11730 and 15470 kilohertz. Voice of Mongolia, 0900 to 0930, 12085 kilohertz. Radio Japan, 1000 to 1030 UTC 9625 and 12 to 1230, 11740 from Singapore. KNLS Alaska 10 to 1100 UTC 9655 kHz. Radio Taiwan International 11 to 1200 UTC 7445 kHz. HJB Australia 1130 to 1145 Saturday to Monday 11. 700 kilohertz. Radio Cairo, 1215 to 1330, 17870 kilohertz. Radio Thailand, 1230 to 1300, 9390 kilohertz. KBS World Radio, 0800 to 0900, 9570 kilohertz. 1230 to 1330, 6095, and 13 to 1400, 9570 kilohertz. BCJ Radio International, 1230 to 1330. Every Sunday on 13.655 kilohertz from Sri Lanka. Ratio Romania International 22 to 2300 UTC 9790 and 11940 to Japan. 0530 to 0630, 17760 and 21500 kilohertz. Reception lags for March 2014. March to Adventist World Radio on 15. 3 to 0 in English, Pram Guam at 2240, SIO 454, March 8, Voice of America on 9900 in English at 1526, SIO 333, March 9, HJ Australia on 15340 in English, Pram Kunura at 1518 UTC, SIO 444, March 9, Radio Veritas Asia on 15 through 320 in English, Pram Palawig at 1520, SIO444. March 16, TWR Philippines on 15160 in English, Pram Guam at 1200, SIO343. And March 20, Radio Japan at 11925 in English, Pram Yamata at 1400, SIO333. We have a special QSL card just for you. For your reception report, please send one IRC international reply coupon or two US dollar. Written postage will be greatly appreciated. And friends, you want to get the transcript of today's Philippines DX News and see our QSL card series, please visit HTPP colon double four slash Philippines DX that wordpress.com. That's HTPP colon double four slash Philippines DX that wordpress. That can follow us also on Facebook, www.facebook.com forward slash PhilippineSDX. Or you may want to send us your comments, suggestions, reception lags, and informations to PhilippineSDX at Yahoo.com. That's P-I-L-I-P-I-N-A-S-D-X for PhilippineSDX at Yahoo. 
Dotcom. This has been Henry Umanay for Race Can in Bacolod City, Negros Occidental, Central Philippines saying mabuhay at maraming salamat po. Thank you, Henry. World Amateur Radio Day is celebrated each year on April 18th to recognize the anniversary of the founding of the International Amateur Radio Union, the IARU, in Paris in 1925. The theme for this year is Amateur Radio, your gateway to wireless communication. The primary purpose of World Amateur Radio Day is to focus a public spotlight on amateur radio and its benefits to countries and communities. This year, the IARU and its more than 150 member societies will celebrate the organization's 89th birthday. Many programs are scheduled by radio amateurs in India also, says Jost Jacob, VU2JOS, who sends this item along to us. Greetings to all of our WaveScan listeners who are also amateur radio operators. We know that uh, many ham operators are regular listeners to this program. And for the remaining minutes on WaveScan today, let's go to Bob Padula in Melbourne, Australia, with some more DX News. Greetings. All times, days, and dates given in our episodes are in UTC, and we use the 24-hour time system. The episodes are compiled from resources made available by the Electronic D-Express Radio Monitoring Association which is based here in Melbourne. Beginning our program this week, we have our information from the Ionospheric Prediction Service in Sydney, New South Wales, here in Australia, concerning solar activity. The IPS reports that solar activity continues to be classified as low. The 10.7 centimetre solar radio flux is hovering at around 149, 149, and the daily equivalent smooth sunspot number is fluctuating around 104. That's 104. And those figures are not expected to change dramatically in the immediate future. So we're now moving through the plateau of solar cycle number 24. The peak of this cycle is expected to occur perhaps sometime later this year. It's 2014, of course, and then it will start to decline. In the meantime, this low level of continuing solar activity means that long-distance multi-hop propagation on darkness or semi-darkness paths above about 14 megahertz will not be very reliable. However, frequencies above about 40 megahertz on the daylight transmission paths will be satisfactory. I'd like to note too that the new international transmission season is effective on March 30th, with many hundreds of frequency changes and new frequencies to be taken into effect by international broadcasters. That will be the A14 or A2014 international broadcast transmission season. Now we have some station news. First of all, broadcasting broadcast of Transworld Radio India in various languages to the Indian subcontinent. The station is now using the new channel of 7280 from Russian Relay Base. This replaces 7545 and the broadcasts are on the air between midnight 30 and and 0130. It programs in Bengali, Hindi, Nepali and Indian languages. So new frequency there for Transworld Radio India. 7280 from Russian Relay Station, replacing 7545. Information received from listeners to our program indicates that you enjoy and appreciate the monitoring monitoring notes which I provide for reception here in South Eastern Australia in Melbourne. So I'm pleased that that is encouraging and I'm pleasing that you find this information of value. 
Now, in our local Melbourne morning period, that's in the period just prior to our sun, sunrise, Court Good Reception is continuing in the 25 metre band, that's the 11 megahertz band. This is a summary I made recently between 1900 and 1915 and that time span revealed many signals mainly from Africa, Europe, the Middle East and Asia via the short transmission path. They included the following. 11580 All India Radio in English and Parallel frequencies were 11670 and for the Arabic service of All India Radio, heard on 11710. Now, 11635, the voice of Korea from Pyongyang in English. And another frequency for the voice of Korea at this time is 11910, also in English. And the further frequency in the 25 metre band for the voice of Korea was 12015. All three frequencies noted with good signals here in Melbourne. This is Bob Padula in Melbourne, in Victoria, Australia. Wishing you all good listening. Thanks for being with us and good DX. See you soon. In today's edition of Wavescan with some Spanish guitar music, Juan Manuel Serrat and Mediterraneo. Thanks for listening to Wavescan, the international DX program from Adventist World Radio, researched and written in Indianapolis by Dr. Adrian Peterson. Next week, tribute to shortwave WYFR Part 9 on the air with WNYW, Radio New York Worldwide. Unusual QSL cards, metal, wood, and plastic, and our Bangladesh DX report. A reminder, if you'd like to send us a reception report, we have two QSL cards available, one for AWR, another from WRMI. You can send your reports to Wavescan, Box 29235, Indianapolis, Indiana, 46229, USA. That's Wavescan. Box 29235, Indianapolis, Indiana, 46229, USA. Our email address is wavescan at awr.org. That's wavescan at awr.org. Till next week, I'm Jeff White at WRMI in Miami. Good listening, everyone. (laughs) 